Judy. Pam wins the award. You knew, didn't you? Good job. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're here. Let's enjoy the Lord this evening. I hope you've come ready for a good meal from God's Word. Let's open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get on with our worship time. Uh, pay attention to the uh, uh, announcements that we have for uh, our calendar. We just have a few things uh, coming up. Um, I didn't really need to uh, announce the bonfires uh, 26th of October. That's at 5 o'clock. We're doing hot dogs and s'mores. Everybody bring uh, a little bit of all of that stuff. And there's a sign-up sheet out there. Uh, mission conference starts uh, November 1st through the 3rd. And please uh, make your calendar available for that. Uh, and be here, be a part of that. Uh, we've been praying that uh, the Lord would uh, just give us a good conference, touch our hearts, and uh, we'll be able to do more for the Lord in that area and really support and sustain uh, the current missionaries that we have. We want to move in the direction of giving them a raise. And uh, and so uh, I hope your heart's prepared for that. Uh, Prime Timers are doing lunch at Liz's. That's the restaurant in Richland right on the main drag across from the the church. Parking back, right in the Hardings parking lot, actually, right? All right, and that is 1 p.m. on November the 9th. And don't forget to vote. November is voting voting time, right? Uh, and then uh, our midweek service for November the 26th will be on Tuesday. That'll be the week of Thanksgiving. So we'll move that uh, there. So let's open up in a word of prayer and... Uh, Let's, let's uh, meet with the Lord tonight. Father, thank you for uh, just the privilege that we have to come to this place, gather together, open up your word, know that we have your word in truth and perfection, and that uh, in, in studying and reading it, Lord, we know your mind, we are introduced to you, to your character, to your person, to the blessed gospel that saves our soul. Lord, I just pray that uh, in the message tonight, we would be challenged and encouraged to serve and live for you, that we might see souls saved and glorify you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Turn to page 443. song will be Since Jesus Came Into My Heart, page 435. What a wonder. 
wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I'm a light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Of joy o'er my soul, like the sea of Since Jesus came into my heart, I'm the best of a hope that is steadfast and sure. Since Jesus came into my heart, and those dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscure. Since Jesus came into of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in the city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I'm happy, so happy as onward I go. Since Jesus came into Our next song will be Once for All. Looks like it's been a long day for everybody out there. Our God, He bridged the great divide to offer us eternal life. Standing hope within a man, oh, is love. Paid it all. All the 
All right, good evening. We're in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter number 4. We're going through the book of 1 and 2 Timothy and uh, just learning and gleaning what uh, Paul the Apostle was teaching his young son Timothy in the faith, which means Paul was uh, the reason Timothy trusted the Lord. Paul was on a preaching uh, mission there and... Um, Timothy heard the gospel, was born into the family of God, and uh, immediately uh, was uh, interested and had a burden for uh, following and serving and ministering uh, as a teacher, as a pastor eventually, and he grew up under Paul's tutelage, and eventually he ends up pastoring the church at Ephesus, and so we've been uh, just gleaning from this letter uh, Paul's admonition to him on how a pastor, a young pastor, uh, young or old, doesn't matter, but how a young pastor in Timothy's particular situation, uh, what are the things he needs to pay attention to in his personal life and in the church to keep that moving in the right direction. We've been gleaning uh, things that we can apply to our heart and life to keep us on the right path moving forward to glorify God and and, uh, and make the church strong. And so um, we have come to <clears throat> verse number um, uh, 14 is where we left off. And so uh, chapter 4, verse number 14, we'll pick up there. And uh, Paul is saying, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. And uh, so we'll just start right here, and the very first thing uh, that we're going to look at is Paul says, don't neglect the gift that, uh, that you have in you. Uh, you need to use it, otherwise uh, it's like a fruit that will dry up on a vine or dry up on a tree. God has given you gifts and certain gifts to be able to be used in your life to bring Him glory, but not only in your life, but in the church. And the church is the place where we're able to minister those gifts to help the local body. Some of those gifts are going to be used uh, as they were in the uh, New Testament in the early church um, to give the gospel and see people saved. There was uh, specific gifts that were given uh, like tongues and healing uh, and, and prophecy uh, as it relates to foretelling, not necessarily proclaiming. Prophecy can mean both of those things. We find in the early church, they had these particular gifts because the Word of God was not completed yet. And those, those miraculous gifts uh, were a sign that these men were speaking from God, for God, and the Word of God. And so he gave them those spiritual gifts um, uh, of certain things like tongues and healing and uh, and, and those kinds of things, uh, so that uh, people would know that there was a prophet and a preacher among them and that they were from God. Uh, those gifts went by the wayside when the Word of God was completed. And, uh, and so not all the gifts went by the wayside, but the miracle gifts, we would call them, those special apostolic gifts that the church had in the early times. So let's look at some of these gifts uh, that uh, Paul's talking about here. And um, also, I want you to open, I don't have it here, but uh, it's just an ad that I had. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter number four, uh, along with some of our other uh, passages. But uh, the gifts, um, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, let me just get to Ephesians so I have it ready to go. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse six and eight, having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, 
whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And these are, uh, these are gifts that uh, you are seeing that would, would help a church body to grow and, and, uh, and have advantage. Uh, it's talking about ministering, and it says, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. In other words, stay in that lane. If that's the gift that God has given you to minister to a body, then, then do that. Uh, if it's prophecy, if it's, if it's preaching or teaching, stay in that lane. Do it. Get busy with it. Uh, if it's on giving, give. Give liberally. Give cheerfully. Do, I mean, just do that. However God has equipped you, and, and these are things that you will find yourself you have a certain bend or a leading uh, in, in how you go through life. Uh, I, I have the gift of giving. I love to give. It is one of the ways that I express. That's one of my love languages is to give. And if you have that love language, you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, it's very easy for you to give. In fact, Sometimes people will take advantage of that, but you don't really care because God's wired you in a way that you just like to give. In fact, if you have the gift of giving, you'd give the shirt off your back, literally. I said to preacher uh, tonight, I said, man, I like your sweater. That's really sharp. He said, you want it? I said, yes. <laughs> and so uh, it's just Paul's admonishing you how what is your bent? How are you wired? And, and, and how would that work in the church? Because God has given you and equipped you with some things that will be profitable in the church, no matter who you are or, what, or, or you know, what your background is. Everybody has gifts that can be used uh, by the Lord for His purpose and His glory. Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 11 and 12, and... Um, it may or may not be up there. I threw them a curveball. The Bible says this about how God works in the church. They said, and he gave some uh, apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so we see that God gives specific um, gifts as it pertains to leading the local work and church. And so, um, again, God is distributing these through the Holy Spirit, and as the Holy Spirit wills, He does, and it's all for the perfecting of the body of Christ, that Christ might be glorified, we might be edified and admonished, and the work of the Lord continues. Corinthians is a huge pas passage of Scripture that talks about um, gifts, and uh, in chapter 12, uh, so if you'll turn there, um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, I have two verses up on uh, the, the screen, but I'm, I'm going to read uh, all the way down, and uh, just to give you the idea of, of how God is using these gifts and what some of those gifts might look like uh, in the church. He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, you say, wait a minute. What about the gifts in Romans? Aren't those spiritual? Well, spiritual gifts are things that God gives us in, in, in a specific fashion for uh, drawing people and building people. Let's read about it. Brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were, gen uh, you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaketh by the Spirit of God, uh, by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are diversities of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but is the same God which worketh in all, which worketh all and in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, 
by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but all these worketh that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So <clears throat> what's going on in 1 Corinthians was, again, that early church. And there's some of these things in there that, that some churches today try to keep those things going. And they're speaking in tongues, and they're doing the faith healing. And, and uh, man, let me just tell you, uh, I, I think God put a pin in that. Uh, in chapter 13, just following this chapter, he says, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And I believe contextually that's talking about the perfecting of the Word of God. And, and when the Word of God came on as a finished uh, work, then the Bible uses verses like, uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the speaking of tongues. healing of the sick. No, see, those things were spiritual gifts that the Spirit gave so that when those things happened, people were drawn to Christ. They were drawn to Him. They, they saw the power uh, that these men had through the Spirit of God, and people were wowed by that. These people must be the servants of God, and, and they were saved because then they heard the preaching of the gospel, not just the gift in and of itself, but that was that early church. Now, some of those things still stay in place. The gift of administration, uh, that's, uh, that's still in fashion. That's still going on right now. The gift of ministering, and so not all of them left, but those miracle gifts uh, that we would call them left. And what was the purpose of any gift? Glorify God and strengthen the body. And so uh, you need to figure out what your gift is, and uh, we may do that uh, coming up uh, here pretty soon, uh, just to be able for you to figure out how you're wired, and you might say, I already know how I'm wired, and I don't know how God can use that in a ministry. Well, He can if it's lent to Him. And so uh, He says, don't neglect the gift that you have. You're a pastor, you're a teacher, uh, stay with that, and uh, that was given to you, so honor it, all right? Uh, so number one, don't neglect the gift that's in you. And He says, which was given thee uh, by prophecy, preaching, right? Uh, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now, we're getting ready to do this. Uh, our missions conference, the Sunday morning of our missions conference, is also going to be Pastor TJ's ordination. Uh, I've got uh, two men that are going to be uh, bringing a message, one to the church, one to uh, uh, Pastor TJ, and then we're going to have a time of prayer and laying on of hands where, where we're agreeing that uh, he has uh, prepared himself and knowledgeable in the Scriptures and conducting himself in a way that is befitting uh, a pastor. And so uh, we're going to be doing that. And he says uh, that, Timothy, that was given to you, and that should be a motivation for you uh, to continue to do it right and, and to do that with honor and to do that with dignity and, and hold that position uh, 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 sacred. Um, and so... Where do we get that where authority is transferred from a group of men onto another man? And by the way, I, I just want to say this. Be very leery of somebody that says, well, I'm just, God called me and I'm just going out on my own and I'm doing my own thing. Not connected to a local church, you better watch out because that man's not scripturally doing it. He's not under submission and he hasn't been approved by somebody of like faith and biblical authority. There's weight to this thing about being a pastor. Not everybody can do it. Not everybody's supposed to do it. And a pastor should be ordained or marked by other godly men that say, we're in agreement that this man's ready. So Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse number 9 and, uh, and while we're, we're, we're getting ready to go there, uh, I'll say this. 
People today don't even take thought about dishonoring or, or, or disregarding the office of pastor in the church. Man, it used to be that even lost people would give you a little respect, right? Uh, man, oh, they're cussing and they find out you're, you're a pastor or even a Christian, right? Oh, I'm sorry, pardon me, right? Well, now they just, they just if they find out I'm a pastor, it means pour it on, right? Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll go over and above just to try to see if they can get me rattled. And, uh, and so uh, this is an important office, uh, that is God-ordained, and there's some authority that goes with it. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord, what? Commanded Moses. And so we see that that authority's commanded. Moses, uh, not only do you just tell the people that Joshua's going to be the next dude in line. He says, Moses, you lay your hands on that man, and you impart some of your authority and power on him. And that's a very distinct uh, uh, position and distinct uh, uh, moving of God in a life of somebody that's going to be leading and ministering uh, back even in the Old Testament and here in the New as well. Acts chapter 6. So we see this thought of transferring power uh, and, and, and laying on of hands or being in agreement with uh, in, in, in the early book of Acts as they chose deacons. Acts chapter 6, verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And so these were the deacons that uh, they looked out, they said, seek ye out men of good report, full of what? Full of the Holy Ghost. So this is not just your uh, average, ordinary Tom, Dick, or Harry. These are somebody uh, that is in the church, rising to the occasion of studying uh, and knowing God and following God and displaying the uh, manifested gifts of the Spirit. And so they laid their hands on them uh, in agreement and gave them that position. Acts 14, verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And so uh, these were pastors that uh, they laid hands on. And so uh, the authority that's transferred to Timothy is the same that we do, that we're going to do in November during our missions conference. And it's the same that I'm sure uh, Pastor Hutchinson had when he was coming up, uh, just when you started uh, pastoring. I had it both for my deacon ordination and my my pastor, pastor ordination, and uh, it's a big deal because it's a big office, and it's God-ordained, and so uh, we say that honor the office. Timothy, don't neglect it. Uh, remember uh, the authority by which this was given to you. Uh, all right, going on, the Bible says uh, in chapter 5 of this same letter uh, that he gives them a little further instruction on this idea of giving somebody authority and laying hands on them. He says, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. And so really what he's saying is, Timothy, if you're going to lay hands on somebody, don't get caught up in uh, other men's sins where there's, they're propagating and promoting somebody for status or position or control. He said, don't get into that mess. Uh, he said, you keep yourself pure, you keep yourself right, understand the, the, the importance, the reverence, the holiness, the dignity by which laying on of hands is furthering the ministry, and that's how you conduct yourself. You don't lay hands suddenly on any man. Uh, oh, somebody gets saved, and, and three days later, they're preaching. Well, you say, I, I've, never heard, I've never heard the like. Well, Man, you ought to go down south and listen to some of these evangelists. I got saved, and the next week, God called me to preach. Well, he may have called you to preach, but he didn't equip you to preach because you ain't studied. And I'm not saying that you can't proclaim the Word of God, but there's a seasoning and a process that has to go into a man of God if he's going to be a pastor. And, and Paul's saying to Timothy, don't lay hands suddenly uh, no man. Let them prove themselves. How diligent are they in the scriptures? 
Are they handling the scriptures properly? Okay. Uh, I've, I've had, uh, I mean, I'm not kidding you. I, l- listen to me. You've had a pastor here in this church that does this. Reads a passage of scripture, picks out one phrase in there, and then preaches a message based on just what he wants to do because that, that chapter or that verse is just lending himself to preaching what he wants to preach. It's, in other words, it's not expository. It's not in context. I'm just, just picking it out here because I want to preach on that. And which, by the way, when I started, you said, if you're going to be pastor here, please don't have that man back. And, and you, have, you have pastors that, I just want to preach a little thought to you. I had this thought on my mind. No, preach the Word of God. Preach it by chapter, preach it by verse, preach it by word, but preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reproof, right? You all know what I'm saying. So preach the word of God. This is so important. You don't lay hands on a guy that doesn't know how to use the word of God. So uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm from that area where there was an awful lot of preachers that didn't really have the knowledge of the Word of God, and consequently, they weren't rightly dividing it, and they weren't preaching correctly. Didn't mean that they didn't love the Lord and have a heart for the Lord, but, you know, if you're going to be a pastor, you got to, I mean, it's just the necessary evil there is you got to work at studying, and uh, I say evil because studying is a weariness. Uh, it'll wear you out, uh, and, and those that are in my Bible class and Sunday school class, you understand what I'm talking about now. All right, so uh, this idea of laying on the hands, big deal, big deal, and Timothy, pay attention to it. You honor that. You don't do it too soon, and let's move on to verse 15. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. And so uh, uh, Paul is telling Timothy, be fully committed uh, to this process of pastoring, this process of your character and uh, living correctly before the Lord. I mean, take it absolutely seriously, not just participate in it, but give yourself wholly to it. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of uh, Stephanus, that uh, it is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted them. Now, that's a good use of the word addiction or addicted. They have addicted themselves to what? To the ministry. If you're going to be addicted to something, you might as well be addicted to God and the working of the Lord. I mean, if that's, that's a good thing. And he says, they've addicted. In other words, they said, all for God, all for Christ. It doesn't matter. This is going to be my, my consuming fire is to serve the Lord. Certainly, Paul was in that camp. He's admonishing Timothy to do the same thing. Romans 12, 1, we've quoted it so much that you've memorized this verse just by me quoting it. You can say it with me. You don't even have to look at the screen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that ye holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so, man, go all in. Now, now this doesn't mean you got to be a pastor to do that. Uh, this could be any believer. Anybody that's serving the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. You owe it to Him. It's the least that you can do to give your body absolutely as a sacrifice to the Lord. He's deserving of that. And so Paul saying, Timothy, just give yourself wholly to it. Not only give yourself wholly to it, uh, but he says there should be a benefit here for others. You giving yourself wholly to Christ should be, as we spoke Sunday morning, the thing by which people see the glory of God in your life as a surrendered servant of God, uh, living for the Lord, sacrificing for the Lord. There's such glory in your life and on your face because God's working through you that a lost person can see it and be drawn to Christ. Hey, you're serious about this thing, aren't you? You're just not one of those uh, Sunday morning Christians, right? I mean, you guys are crazy. You're here on Wednesday night. You're taking time to study the Word. You read the Bible every day. Man, you guys are whacked. 
Well, why do we do those things? To build ourselves up? No. So that as God does a work in us and through us, the world sees that the Lord has changed us and we belong to him. And, uh, and so he says, that thy profiting may appear to all. So uh, Matthew 5, 16, I quoted this Sunday. You can also probably quote this. We've been hitting this a lot. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the purpose is not you getting glorified. The purpose is that God gets glorified through you. And uh, we get that wrong sometimes. Sometimes we want the spotlight on us. Hey, look at how good we are, how good of it. No, it's how we serve the Lord should be uh, that somebody says, man, God's really using you or working through you or blessing you. And when you point to him, that, that is apparent to other people and they pay attention to that. So <clears throat> let your light shine. Philippians says it this way, <clears throat> that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom, here it is, ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And so we are to shine as lights in the world. We are to be a witness, a testimony. It does matter how we live. Modern day Christianity, it says, live however, oh hush, live however you want and do whatever you want. Uh, and and uh, it's okay because God just loves you and accepts everything. And uh, he's this neutered God uh, that, uh, hey, you're homosexual, that's fine. You're, you're a whoremonger, that's fine. Uh, you're, I mean, you know, you're a drunkard or a drug addict or whatever. Just keep on with that. No, God will accept you where you're at. But when God saves you, the Spirit of God takes up residence in you and a change is made so that you shine God forth to this world. It's not being saved and continuing. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God what? God forbid. And so it does matter how you live. We just can't operate in the fact that God is love. We're learning this on Tuesday night going through the attributes of God. But God's just. God's holy. You know, we, we, we talk so much about, uh, oh, the love of God. We don't have enough fear of God in us. The fear of God, man, ought to motivate you for living right. <sighs> well, anyway, that thy profiting may appear to all. That may seem arrogant to some, and some may abuse that, but don't let that be a reason for you not to even be concerned with testimony. Testimony is an important thing, and don't give any ground on that in modern-day Christianity where they say you can do and live however you want, and God still loves you. Can I just remind you of the fact that the love of God has a position, and it's at the cross of Calvary, and that the cross of Calvary it pictures death. And as I spoke Sunday morning, you can't see the glory of God without dying to your flesh. You won't shine without dying to your flesh. And that's why we've got so many people naming the name of Christ, living like they did when they were lost, and God's not getting any glory. And, and, and people are putting that thing on like it's just some cute religious trinket, and there's just no power. There's no power associated with that. But a life surrender to God, great power. Let's pass out our prayer bulletins, and let's be mindful of these things as the Spirit of God encourages us to live like this thing matters, because it does.